Geraldine Jameson interview, brought to you by Tinwald Mills St. John's. Hello and a warm welcome to this week's programme. My guest today, as well as being a recognised expert in his chosen field, has manned the ceramics table on the BBC's Antiques Roadshow for a quarter of a century. Eric Knowles became a regular TV face in the 1990s, with appearances on Crime Watch UK, Going for a Song, The Great Antiques Hunt, Jim Davidson's The Generation Game, Countdown, and of course the Jimmy Young Show on BBC's Radio 2. Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, he has written books on subjects such as Victoriana, Art Nouveau, Art Deco, Royal Memorabilia. In fact, the famous pottery of Royal Dalton launched the Eric Knowles character jug. And he was responsible for the London auctioneer's Bonham's internationally renowned sales of Lalique Glass. Well, Eric, welcome along. I've actually got you right here on you the have. Eye of Man. <laughs> but I must say, Go on. minus bow tie yes. and the tash. Yes. Why? Uh, uh, well, first of all, it's quite obvious that you've been talking to my mother, having got uh, that eulogy out of the way. But uh, why the bow tie and, and why no bow tie and why? The, well, Geraldine, you know, I'm the sort of chap that, you know, I can't help it. I tend to open up to people and you've got the knack of getting people to open up big time. And um, yes, it, it's all to do with midlife crisis, I think, <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, I got to the stage whereby after having it for sort of 30 years or more, um, my wife actually thought that a change would be as good as a rest. Um, so it went, the moustache went. Uh, and the bow tie, well, to be frank with you, that, that's been gone for about two to two and a half years, something like that. It's just that I seem to be switching on the TV um, and daytime television is sort of uh, full of antique programmes these oh, days. We'll come to that in a minute. And, you know, I seem to be cloning people that look like me. <laughs> so, you know, it was a great time to make that quantum leap and make that change. I mean, do people still recognise you? You came through the airport, Ron's way here today. Um, you know, were, were people coming and saying, "Oh, it's, it's his you, is it?" Well, I, to be frank with you, I've got you know, I've got my anonymity back, and I quite like it. Um, and and you know, and, and in the past, I've got to tell you that more people came up to me and said, "Do you think this weather's going to get any better?" <laughs> than asked me about their antiques because I tend to be confused with John Ketley. Oh God! And I know John. Because John and I, uh, we've both embraced apathy with open arms because we both support Burnley Football Club. And I did say to so him... So you're both Lancashire born and bred? Well, no, technically speaking, he's just the wrong side of the border because he's just into sort of Todmorden, which if I can tell you, and I'm sure there's people listening who are from that neck of the woods... Uh, who are doing missionary work over here, uh, will tell you that the, the county line runs through the middle of Todmorden Town Hall. So you can have one foot in Lancashire and one foot in Yorkshire. But they do play cricket in the Lancashire League. I think that, that, that's fair enough. But the point I'm trying to get to is that I said to John, I said, do people come up to you, John, and say things like, uh, but you can't put a value on my wife? <laughs> and he said, no. And, and I know that he's a fibber. That's a polite word for something else, uh, because I've met his mum. And she came to see me at a valuation day in Todmorden. And she said, you know, our John's always been mistaken for you. And then she left me a photograph of John and went on the way. Yeah. And uh, so I know for a fact that, um, that he does get mistaken for me. Mm. And there was something in the newspapers saying, is it the same person? Ah. And they, uh, the BBC um, tackled that one by putting us both on Call My Bluff on opposite teams. So we are not the same person, and I think I'm taller than him anyway. <laughs> Just by a, a, a tad, fra a, a tad. fraction, yeah. Well, now, um, it was very important to your parents. I mean, this is how, how you started off, really, which is unusual in antiques. Um, I mean, you're not all that old, but even so, it's <laughs> going back just a little way. But your love of antiques was inherited from your parents, I gather. Well, you were born and bred up, brought up in Nelson. Nelson in Lancashire, that's right. And um, yes, my you know my mum and dad when we were kids, they used to take us to museums and stately homes and castles, and and that part of the world is um, you know it's full of all that mm. stuff. You know, I, I grew up in Pendle Witch Country, you know, and I think I was taught maths by one of them, um, and. Um, you know, we would go into these wonderful old houses. And to be honest with you, Geraldine, I think it might have been solvent abuse that got me interested because I get a real buzz from the smell of beeswax. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You go into these wonderful polished halls, the smell of beeswax hits your nostrils, doesn't it? But no, I'm a, you know, I am a romantic. 
let me confess everything to you now. Because I would go into, say, Townley Hall in Burnley, and you, there's the long gallery. And, you know, I would recreate in my childish mind's eye Elizabethan ladies and gentlemen just parading up and down the place. And, and um, somehow history was, has always been alive for me. It's never been a dead subject. And I still get a great buzz out of anything historical. I mean, you know, if I'm switched onto anything in television, it, it tends not to be the antique programmes. It tends to be the time teams and the David Starkeys and of this world. That, those are the people that, you know, I hold in sort of high esteem. Well, ceramics, I mean, you, you honed in ceramics pretty quickly, really. I mean, your, your fields sort of... Uh, stretch from European and Oriental ceramics from the 17th and 20th century. The glass, of course, of Tiffany and Lalique, I refer to that as the very famous Bonhams um, sales of Lalique glass, and the 19th and 20th century decorative, decorative arts. But, I mean, that's I quite, quite a lot to embrace, surely. Oh, well, it's, it's the old business. You can't keep brilliance down, can you, really? You can't, once it's manifested itself. And modesty. No, I go off at tangents, Geraldine. I mean, I've got an interest in so many different things, and there's so much to learn, and I haven't got enough time. You know, I'm not being fatalistic, yeah. you know, because, you know, let's face it, nobody's got out of life alive yet, have they? Um, but, you know, there is just so much to learn. And when it comes to pots, and the, for the benefit of anybody here on the island who's from Yorkshire and Lancashire, that's crockery. <laughs> okay, so they don't get too confused. See, I work on the ceramics table on the Antiques Roadshow, and I work on the miscellaneous table. But when we're in Yorkshire, when we're in Lancashire, we have another sign, you know, for ceramics that says crockery, and we have another sign for miscellaneous that says alt else. So it doesn't get too confusing for the natives sort of thing. But pots, they're cheap. You know, I mean, as a, you know, as a boy, I know when I say a boy, I mean, I got interested when I was about 15, 16, 17, and, and through, as much through Arthur Negus, the great Arthur, and, uh, it, I mean, Sunday afternoons was always going for a song. I was going to say. I loved it. In real television, you know, black and white. Mm -hmm. And um, You were the expert. I... Well, I eventually, when they revamped the programme, yes. I mean, I was brought in as the expert on the revised version, you know, with Michael Parkinson in the chair. More of that later. Uh, but back in the, the late 60s, early 70s, it was compulsory viewing. And my dad used to keep a score, me and my brother would have to um, give the values and he'd keep a check who was the nearest. And um, whoever lost, washed up. So the motivation was there for me to learn. So if, you, if you're ever in Spain, if you go to Granada and you meet somebody called Brian Knowles, the chances are he's still got very wrinkly fingers. He did far more washing up than I did. So, you know, it, it's, it's more than a job. You know, it's it's a passion, mm -hmm. and you know I never ever get bored of it. Yeah. When I, I'd like to just ask you a little bit about the leak, because I mean there are leak and Tiffany glass followers, the length and breadth of the British Isles, and indeed um, the world, and certainly Europe. Um, I mean, this business of auctionitis, really. <laughs> Despite great strides in medical science, there hasn't been a, a, a reliable cure yet. It seems to be still a long way off. Oh, it's terminal. terminal. The secrets of buying <laughs> at auction, apart from not putting up your hand, but you, you need to sort of go before the sale starts and all that. Do you? I think you know if, you, if you've you know got in mind to start going to auctions. Yes, I think it's you know let yourself in easy. You know, just go along and just see the the sort of machinations of how it all happens, and don't be tempted. Because, you, you know, you're bound to see something come up that looks as though it's incredibly cheap. And there's usually a good reason why the bidding is so low. Mm. It's probably because the hand's been off and it's been re-glued on or there's, there's a new chair leg been stuck on it. The, the secret when it comes to, to auctions is just, is just to, to keep going to them and go to the views, obviously. Um, ask lots of questions. I mean, a good auction house will have staff on hand to answer any questions that you may have. And it's a great learning ground. Um, you know, let me tell you, you know, f auctions are free. I mean, for goodness sake, don't tell Gordon Brown there'll be a tax on them. You know. <laughs> that wasn't really a political statement. It was just an observation of life under the regime. But, you know, it, it's one of those places where you can actually go into Bonhams, dare I say Sotheby's and Christie's, and you can actually go and pick up a Ming bowl if you want to. I mean, they might check your breath if it's after, you know, if it's in the afternoon, you know. But 
I mean, you, the thing about museums, museums are fabulous, and I love going to museums, but it's so frustrating that you can't pick the stuff up. And with pots, you know, you've got to pick them up. It's a tactile thing. Um, but getting back to Lalique, um, I, I'm a, I had a sale of one man's collection of about 50 pieces of Lalique about 25 years ago. And then that seemed to spur on more people to bring me Lalique. And eventually I was having sales that were bringing in close on two thirds of a million just in one evening. Um, and I've, I'm fascinated by Lalique. I've never got bored of Lalique. Um, there, there, there are th three or four people. Lalique is one. Tiffany, you mentioned. Tiffany, because um, growing up in Nelson, nearby is the town of Accrington. Accrington fits strategically between Burnley and Blackburn, okay? It's the DMZ, as the Americans say. It's the demilitarized zone. <laughs> There's no love lost between Burnley and Blackburn, certainly when it comes to football, anyway. That's another story. But in Accrington, there's this great collection of Tiffany glass that was bequeathed uh, by a local lad, made good, uh, called Joseph Briggs. And Briggs, uh, in 1890, uh, decided that he wanted to uh, to give up his job working as a designer at Steiner's, the uh, the silk uh, manufacturers and the textile company in Accrington. And he went to New York. He wanted to work for Tiffany. And for three years, he kept going in and out asking for a job and, and got nothing. Um, and um, in the interim period, um, he found himself working on a Wild West show, would you believe? Anyway, cut a long story short, a few years ago, oh gosh, I say a few years, it's my age showing through, 20 years ago, <laughs> uh, I spoke to his son, who's now um, now deceased, and he was saying, well, yeah, Pa went over and uh, he went into Tiffany's after three years and uh, he was told yet again that there was no work to be had. Um, and as he came out, uh, the heavens opened and it came down like steroids and this rather grand coach and four pulled up and this very distinguished gentleman wearing a top hat leaned out and my father, being a good Lancashire man, uh, went and offered him his umbrella and escorted him to the door. Uh, the man turned around and said, young man, what are you doing coming out of my emporium? The man in question was Louis Comfort Tiffany, oh. the man himself. And he said, uh, well, I've come for a job like, but I'm told there's no doing like, you know. <laughs> You can tell I went to the Fred Dinner School of Elocution, can't you? <laughs> Compulsory where I grew up, this accent. Anyway, uh, he said, well, let's not be so hasty. So he set him on, sweeping up, and eventually he worked his way through the ranks into the mosaic department, into the ecclesiastical department, um, into the, um, the, the, the the lampshade department. Because when you think of Tiffany, mm. you, you tend to think of Tiffany lamps, of course, those beautiful leaded stained glass lamps. Mm. And... Uh, he became Tiffany's right-hand man. And so in the late 20s, when uh, Tiffany decided to fold the company, because it never made a profit, mm. you know, they, I mean, when we're talking Tiffany, we are talking Tiffany & Co. insofar as that was Louis Comfort Tiffany's father's company. So the two were sort of cousins, if you will, um, the two companies. Mm. Um, and um, it was Briggs, Joseph Briggs, who uh, wound up um, Tiffany's affairs, mm. brings his collection back to Accrington, and he gives half of it to various relatives and he gives the other half um, to the borough council. Because, you know, 1930, it's out of fashion. They don't know what to do with it. I mean, it's locked away for donkey's years. It comes out, I think, sometime in the 60s uh, when all of a sudden it's, be, you know, there's a resurrection of interest in America. And you know, there was, up until I arrived on the scene there, uh, because I've been responsible for it from a valuation point of view since 1977, and when I arrived, it, there, there was one councillor who wanted to sell the collection so they could build some decent urinals in Great Harwood. <laughs> I mean, that's what you're up against. Um, I mean, this is, you know, the most important collection uh, outside the United States. And it was there in this wonderful iridescent glass, fabulous Art Nouveau organic forms. I mean, this is where I discovered Art Nouveau. Um, and, it, you know, it led on to other things. So, so you know... I've I, must, had a I, there. I must jump in here because you, you're talking about America and New, and New York in particular. I watched the last program, in which you figured greatly, of the Antiques Roadshow. I mean, it's rested for the summer. I think it's coming back in September, it isn't it? It is. And it was about this statuette that this girl had, and she'd, she'd built a conservatory. <laughs> she could have built about two conservatories of the value. And you actually flew to New York to get that properly valued, you know, or, or to substantiate your valuation. Well, I'm very fortunate that I do get, go backwards and forwards, and, and you know, I've specialised in American decorative arts as a result of Tiffany. But getting back to that wonderful, I've got to be careful how I word this, that beautiful bust of that young girl. Yeah. Beautiful, The girl was bust. pretty and the bust was pretty. Wasn't it wonderful? And 
you know, it's in Scunthorpe. I mean, who would have thought, you know, um, when I was travelling to Scunthorpe, I had all sorts of jokes given to me. But, the, you know, one of the most wonderful things. And, yes, she bought a conservatory. She built a conservatory. Her neighbour had come in and said, I've got just the right thing for that slot, that, that gap. And, um, and you know, when I saw it, it was a Pygmalion moment. I mean, I, I just, my knees went weak. Um, and, you know, you might think I'm a sad case and you might think I need therapy, but it was just such a wonderful object. And when I saw the name, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's when you see a great painting and you look down the bottom right corner, it says Rembrandt, you know, Agathon Leonard, a great name. You've got, you've got Alphonse Mucha in Art Nouveau, you've got uh, um, Bouval amongst others and Chalon, and you've got Leonard. Um, just a magic name. And... A one-off. I'd love to know who that young girl was, and um, I, I did show it. I did. I took the image with me to New York, and I showed it to this friend of mine because I put fifteen thousand pounds on it. I mean, hey, you know, you've but, got to. But, but the American value did it. Well, he did. I mean, the he way said, up in the fifties was it? Well, the thing was, he, you know, his, to be precise, he said, well, if we can put a provenance to the piece, we know who the subject is. Eric, I think we're looking at fifty thousand pounds. You know, he's from mm. Brooklyn, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he would have been a Dodgers man if they'd been around. Uh, but he's quite a character. And um, I've got to say, Frank, I'm sure you're right. But the proof of the pudding will only be in the eating. And um, I think she was quite attached to that, uh, that marble busk. I mean, you know. Well, now, one of your favourite pastimes, or certainly one of the favourite people and places, but this particular place, actually, the Hill House at Helensburg, an unequivocal testament to the work of Charles Rennie Mackintosh. How did your passion begin with this particular, very um, inventive, innovative, mm. marvellous decorator and designer, Mackintosh? Well, I mean, he fits in with Tiffany, he fits in with La Ligue. Um, um, Charles Rennie Mackintosh is an enigma to me. He's a mystery man. The more I learn about him, the less I know. But what an inventive, well, you know, it's an overused word, Genius. It is so overused these days. But in Macintosh's case, um, he truly was a one-off. You say that, Eric, because <laughs> I'm talking to <laughs> myself a lot these days, you know. And I'm of, often in a stage where I'm at the top of the stairs wearing, w wondering why I've gone there. Have you ever been there? Oh, been yes. The top of the if I've got a toilet roll in my hand, it's an aid mm. memoir, you know. That's why I'm at the top of the stairs. Anyway, getting back to the point before I go off. I'm coming to rapidly <laughs> to that stage. <laughs> <laughs> the, going back to Charles Rennie Macintosh. Um, he, he really, when you're talking about Macintosh, you've got to bring Margaret Macdonald, his wife, into the equation. He actually said about her that she was the genius. Yes. He only had talent. Yes. They were soul partners. Um, it is so obvious in their collaboration. I mean, I've never seen work with two souls so totally intertwined. Um, you said it was like stepping into a silvery glade. Oh, the Hill House, mm -hmm. Helensburgh. It, anybody going over there, do it. Because Where is Helensburgh? Well, Helensburgh is, um, it's about 40 miles sort of just north of Glasgow, up the Clyde. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, 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 a, it's an experience. It's, I mean, it is almost, maybe it is, it's a spiritual experience going into that place. I mean, Architect-wise, um, I mean, Macintosh is the ultimate. He creates wonderful interiors with such consideration for light and space. He designs everything within that interior. And there's a tranquility in there. Um, and there is, it's a, it's a sort of a fantasy type place. It's, and when you think that this is dating from sort of like 1902, 1903, it just beggars belief. I mean, so many of the elements in there, are, they could almost be Art Deco from the 1920s, 1930s. And to a certain degree, he might be seen without getting too complex uh, as one of the sort of progenitors, one of the fathers of modernism. Uh, because I made a programme about Macintosh um, called The House That Macintosh Built, which was his last um, commission, his only commission in England, which was a, a small house in Northampton, mm -hmm. number 78 Derngate, owned by Bassett Loke, um, the, the, the man who made models of trains. And, uh, and it is um, a wonderful place. I, I actually chronicled the restoration of this place. It, it is, you know, one of the most important uh, interiors of the, of the early 20th century. How it's did, a tiny place, though. How did Macintosh get these owners? I mean, he was, he was working for them, obviously. I mean, he was being paid, you know. And how did he get them to involve his, which were quite outrageous designs at the time? He was so lucky. 
he was in he was in the right place at the right time. I mean, he, there he is. He's in Glasgow in 1898, 1899. I mean, Glasgow is the second most important city in probably the world, I would have thought. You've got London, Glasgow, then perhaps New York. You know, that's the way it was. Um, you know, the shipbuilding, the money in Glasgow was just incredible. And, and you know, I, listen, we could go on about Macintosh forever. <laughs> well, I have to say to you that in a few weeks' time, coming on this programme of mine, I have a, an American expert in the life and works of Archibald Knox. This, this American comes from Philadelphia. I know this man. And Zurich in Switzerland. We're talking Dr. Steve Stephen Martin. Martin. Yes. yes. Well, how would you rate Knox in comparison to Macintosh? Well, how would you compare Rembrandt to Vermeer? Ah. <laughs> it's the same sort of uh, analogy. You can't, of course. I mean, the great thing about coming over to the island is occasionally I do meet ladies of advanced years who were taught art by Archibald Knox. Quite incredible. But Knox, again, a great inventive spirit. Um, and, you know, I've been fascinated by Archibald Knox. And, and every time I, uh, I, I come over to the island, it, if it's not Archibald Knox, it's Bailey Scott. Let's not forget Bailey Scott. Indeed, indeed. Um, wonderful buildings. Wonderful buildings. Uh, you're blessed, actually. You are blessed uh, with some great buildings on this island. But Knox, he's the man. I think I would say that Macintosh was the boss. And I'd say Lalique would, well, they don't have a king in France anymore, did they? They cut off his head, but uh, um, he's the bee's knees. Well, why would an American, do you think, you know, get, get uh, such a passionate interest in someone so remote, really, from Pennsylvania? Well, I think it's all down to the individual. I mean, I do, as I mentioned, I do know, I've met Steve Martin and he's, he's a real character. And he's, it's all to do with that magic word, Geraldine. He's passionate. He's passionate about Knox. Mm -hmm. And I've got his book and it's, you know, I look at it and the wonderful colour illustrations. I know, I just drool. I just drool. I mean, I can't afford this stuff. You know, I've got this expensive hobby. It's called children. So there's no way <laughs> on earth. What is your house like? I mean, is it full of contents or do you have a favourite piece of your own I've there? Got, or what? To be honest with you, I've got very little. Because when you've done as many probates as I have, you realise that we don't own a thing. We just pay for the privilege of being its custodian. And do I want the insurance problem? No, thank you. I mean, my house at the moment is full of DJ equipment for, you know, for my teenage son. Um, I do have a few bits. Um, I mean, I've got the very first cup and saucer that I bought back in 1971. Um, what about Charles and Camilla? You know, when they the, the, the changed the date of the wedding... Oh. And, and I believe I believe a, you know a mug or something would be five five pounds and then I, it, or fifteen pounds and it went up to fifty five. I can go one better than that. <laughs> I, as a, as you may know, I am a, I am actually um, um, an ambassador of the Prince's Trust. But um, I came home from uh, working away for a couple of days, and there is um, there's a box, a cardboard box on my desk, and I looked inside, and there's a little card, and it said, you know, um, just a little a reminder of our wedding. Charles and Camilla. So I opened the box and there's a there's a tin, a beautifully printed tin with their ciphers on. And I opened it and there was a piece of wedding cake in there. Can you believe it? It had the right date on as well, because they did change the date, as we know. Um, now, I should point out that there should have been two pieces of wedding cake in there. But, and I'll <laughs> spill the beans, my wife ate one, and which I was distraught. <laughs> because, you know, she destroyed... You know, she ate money. Well, it could be, you know, you've got to have these things intact, haven't you? And I have to be honest with you, I couldn't resist. I had to eat the other piece. I shared it. Oh, I shared it shame with myself. on you. No, but, no, no, this is, this, is, this is where I'm canny. And I don't mind telling you this, because you know I open up to you, Geraldine. I've told you that, haven't I? I actually photographed the piece of cake before I ate it. So I knew exactly how much there was cake how much marzipan and how much icing sugar, just in case I have to recreate it. <laughs> but I've spilled the beans now, anyway, haven't I? Well, the clock has beaten us. Just tell us about your latest book. I think it's uh, the Eric Knowles um, Antiques. Yes, it's called Eric Knowles Antiques. It's a beginner's guide. It's going to ah. come out in um, uh, the end of September, October. Um, it's a labour. It's been a labour of love. I locked myself away in a room for three or four months to do this. Um, and every time I write a book, I come out saying I'm never going to do that again. But um, I think this book is going to be, it's going to be special. It's got 
something like nearly one and a half thousand um, colour illustrations of things that have never been seen before. It's a fresh book. Um, there's, a, there's plenty of the very basics about what you might need uh, to, uh, uh, to get that, to know that little bit more about antiques. The only thing that you've got to add to the equation, as I keep saying, is passion. Well, I'm sure my audience will agree with me today that my guest is one of those rare individuals who is able to share his considerable knowledge in a way that is both exciting and easy to understand. Eric knows, I know you're only here for one day, in case we're absolutely inundated with people ringing up, how can they get hold of you? <laughs> Thank you very much once again for joining me on the Geraldine Jameson interview this week. It's a pleasure. shop Tim Wald Mills now open Sundays 2 till 5 p.m. take a fresh look at Tim Wald Mills St. John's <laughs>